Hello, and welcome to Ancient Words Speak Today. I'm Pastor Nathan Kraus, and I invite you to join me as together we look into the pages of Scripture to discover how the Bible is still relevant to our lives and how these ancient words really do speak today. If you can imagine what it would have been like to be in the Haight-Ashbury district in the 1960s, maybe some of you were there, I don't know, but don't put your hand up if you were. But you know what was going on in that section of San Francisco in the 1960s. Well, after the hippie movement kind of passed, that once again became a high-rent district of San Francisco, and the hippies were forced to move out. And they eventually ended up many of them moved to the Santa Cruz Mountains, a beautiful place to live, get married and raise children, perhaps not in that order with many of the hippies, but they did so. And their children were named, well, not Melissa and Doug or John and David, but many of them had names like Sunray and Moonbeam and Wildflower and uh, Love and Earth and Sky and these were the kids that would end up going to public school, and teachers would have to get used to calling them names that were different from all the names they'd heard over the years. Well, one little fellow went to school, and you know they would always put on the first day of school, they'd slap a name tag on the kids, and because uh, many of them were shy, and they wouldn't you know, tell the teacher their name, so the teacher would at least know what to call the child when they addressed the new child. And so this one little boy, went to class and the teacher said, hello, fruit stand, I'm glad you're here today in kindergarten. Would you like to take a seat? And the boy always, you know, he just kind of seemed odd. All throughout the day she was saying, fruit stand, would you like a snack now? Fruit stand, would you like to read a book? And he always looked at her with a funny look and didn't really respond. No, no big deal though, because that's how new students were sometimes. Well, all through the day this was going on, and at the end of the day, the students would line up and then the teachers would ask them, which bus do you need to get on to go back to your home? When they asked Fruit Stand, do you know which bus you're supposed to go to? Again, Fruit Stand didn't reply. He thought, they, they're not talking to me. And so they thought, no worry. His name is on the front and the bus stop is on the back, so we'll know where to put them. They always put the bus stop on the back of the tags. That was a tradition. So they flipped over the, the, the fruit stand's name tag, and on the back it said, Anthony. <laughs> He'd had his name tag on backwards all day long, and little Anthony was being called fruit stand because he was supposed to get on the bus that would drop him off at the fruit stand. <laughs> Names are significant. And while Shakespeare may have asked what's in a name through Romeo and Juliet, there is a great significance to a name because the name signifies character, identity, even authority, personality. And in the case of Jesus, we've just heard the scripture from Acts 4.12, which says there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. What's so special about that name, and what is it about that one name that God wants us to understand today? I invite you to bow your heads, and we'll pray before we open his word. Father in heaven, thank you for the name of Jesus, powerful, awesome, and precious to us. We pray that today, as we read your word and look at this passage in the book of Acts, your Holy Spirit would be present here with us to give us enlightenment and understanding. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, we're taking a look at Acts chapter 4. You remember that we had just finished looking at what happened in chapter 3 with the healing of this man. He'd been lame. He was over 40 years old, lame all his life, waiting for healing, never found it, and became a beggar. He was the paralyzed panhandler, and there he waited by the temple. It was a great location. You may know that even today, uh, location is everything, not just in real estate, but in begging as well. And sometimes homeless people will, you know, 
fight over who has the rights to a particular intersection. Well, this guy had a great location. On the way to the temple, people would feel more obliged to give as they were heading to their religious experience at the temple. And he was doing all right as a beggar, but he had no hope of ever walking. He'd given up on that long ago. And then Peter and John come along with no money to offer, but something much better. And through the name of Jesus, he was healed. Well, that story spread like wildfire throughout Jerusalem. And now it leads up to chapter 4 in the book of Acts. Peter had an opportunity to preach a sermon based on what followed after the healing of this man who became the unparalyzed unpanhandler. Verse 1, chapter 4. Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them in the middle of the sermon. It would be as if you were sitting in church and someone bursts into the doors and interrupts the sermon and arrests the preacher. That's what happened. As they were speaking, the people in charge, the religious rulers, show up and arrest Peter and John. Who was it? The priests, the captain of the temple. Those were not special police forces, although they were well-trained and capable. They were Levites who were used to guard the temple. One of them became a general in later years, one of those the captains. So they, they did have some military expertise. Um, and the Sadducees. Who were the Sadducees? Remember the two ruling groups, or the two, not, not ruling, but the two prominent groups of Judaism were the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadduc Sadducees take their name from Zadok, who was the high priest in the time of David, his lineage were the Sadducees, those that followed in his line, and they were the ones who controlled the temple for the most part. There were a few Pharisees in the midst, but the Pharisees were kind of the holy and righteous among the common people. They were the ones who prescribed how to live. You know, here's the, the priests and the Levites in charge of the temple, but where the rubber hits the road here, where we are living we look to the Pharisees for understanding of how to apply the scriptures. And there were these two groups. There were a few Pharisees that would have been in the group of scribes. We're going to talk about them later. But primarily, the Sadducees ran the show when it came to the temple. They had the power. They show up here, and they interrupt the preaching. One important thing to note about Sadducees is that they really didn't have much interest in an afterlife they didn't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. Remember, Jesus tripped them up because of that when they challenged him. And they also believe the best thing that we can enjoy here is what God's already giving us. God has given us an opportunity to live as Jews in peace under Roman rule. And actually, we even have some power under Roman authority. They've given us some liberty to have our own temple guard and actually make some judgments, although they couldn't execute someone, right? That was why they had to appeal to the Romans for the execution of Jesus. That was what you could expect according to the Sadducees. Enjoy life here and now. This is it. Now Peter is up there preaching about the resurrection of Jesus, and that doesn't sit well with this philosophy and theology that the Sadducees had adopted. Because if Peter's right, suddenly they lose their authority and their power. Somebody's challenging what they've been teaching the people. And so they show up and interrupt his sermon. They came upon them, and in verse 2 it says, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people. I mean, these people were beside themselves. This just couldn't go on. They were greatly disturbed. Um, if you have a King James Version, I think it may say greatly grieved, but greatly disturbed is, is the right translation. They weren't grieved about it. They were upset about it. Why? Because they were teaching the people, first of all. Who were these unschooled guys showing up and teaching? They didn't have authority. They weren't trained by the scribes, and they weren't authorized to teach. So that was the first problem, that they were teaching at all. The second problem was what they were teaching. They preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And it does say they preached 
in Jesus, the resurrection. Because before, the Pharisees could speak about a resurrection, but it was just theory. Okay, we can argue about that all day long between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They didn't agree, but they didn't care too much. The Sadducees didn't care about the Pharisees because it was just a theory, their interpretation of Scripture. But now you have some people who are actually preaching the resurrection in Jesus, meaning in Jesus we have seen evidence of a resurrection. Over 500 people had seen Jesus alive after he was crucified. This is no longer theory. This is something that they were witnesses to, and they were boldly proclaiming it, and that was a little harder to oppose. Now, the background there is set, and you understand why they were so unhappy about these guys preaching to the people. Verse 3, And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Um, trial was not supposed to happen at night. And in Jeremiah 21, 12, if you look back there, it, it says that uh, they should exe execute judgment in the morning. And so they took that to mean that you don't do anything at night as far as executing judgment in a trial, and it should happen in the morning. And so they put them away since it was near sunset already. They had gone up to the temple to pray. Remember when they met the blind, I mean the paralyzed man? It was around the hour of prayer, which would be three in the afternoon. Then all this stuff happened, and they're preaching, so it's already near sunset. There was no time to have the proper trial, so they have the authority to arrest them and jail them. Jailing was not usually a sentence. It was just that they were holding them until they could be judged and then sentenced. They put them in jail overnight. I wonder how that night went. Who slept better that night, Peter and John, or the priests and the Sadducees? <laughs> I would venture to say that while Peter and John may have been concerned and uneasy, and their loved ones on the outside were concerned and uneasy about how this was all going to play out, the people who were really troubled that night were the religious leaders because they were the ones who were feeling most threatened. They had killed the problem, they thought, when they killed Jesus Christ. But now it's as if he's back and speaking again through the mouths of his followers. How do they end this problem named Jesus? Because even after having killed him, they still can't silence him. He speaks through his followers. Is that still true today? Is Jesus speaking through his followers? Well, you and I are his followers. We can answer the question. We have some say in the matter. Jesus was speaking through his followers, and they could not silence them. So they arrested them, held them in jail that night, and they had all night to plan how they were going to deal with these guys the next morning. Verse 4, however... Many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. Okay, you can, you can arrest them. You can interrupt their sermon right in the midst of it. You can put them in jail and plan to deal with them in the morning. But in the meantime, people who heard about it are believing. You can't stop God's work from going forward by using your earthly authority. It's the same today. People are trying to silence the gospel. They're trying to kill the prophets, those who profess the truth for God, those who are outspoken for the truth. But they can't stop God's work from going forward. And now the number of believers is increasing again because of this event. It says the number of men, the Greek word is aner, it's not anthropos, which would be like mankind. It's specifically speaking of males. The number of males now grew to be 5,000, about 5,000. It's a rough number. They were about, they're jumping up now exponentially, right, from the, the last event at the Sermon of Pentecost. Now, the question is this. If there's 5,000 men, how many is that altogether? At least 10,000, we could assume, when you include men, women and children. Maybe 15,000. Do you realize what a threat this was when there were only, according to Josephus at this time, there were only about 6,000 
Pharisees in Jerusalem. Now the numbers of Christians, when you include women and children, were outnumbering the Pharisees, who were supposed to be the ones who helped people understand what the law is and how to apply it. God was doing something awesome here. There was a movement growing that could not be stopped, although they weren't ready to give up yet. They were going to do their best to stop this thing. Verse 5, And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, the rulers would have been those uh, priests there who were in the ruling class, the elders were the respected leaders of the, the community, and the scribes were the learned ones, the ones who were taught the scriptures and were able to teach the scriptures themselves. As well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. They all show up for this big trial. Nobody wants to miss it. You know, it's, it's like uh, if they could have the press in the courtroom, they would be there. But anybody who could possibly be there to witness this, they were in attendance. Annas was the high priest. However, Caiaphas was, had been appointed. You see, the Romans had come in and, and tried to remind the Jews who's really in charge. According to the Jewish tradition, the high priest's office was a lifetime office. It was kind of like being appointed to the Supreme Court. It's a lifetime appointment. That's why it's so critical. That's why it's such a political event when a president is appointing a high priest. I mean, <laughs> a high priest. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> a Supreme Court justice because they are going to be there for a lifetime and those decisions are going to be affecting the land for their entire lifetime. So, they came in and said, wait a minute, although Annas is the high priest, they deposed him and put Caiaphas on the throne. Actually, there was another before that. They were just kind of switching them up a little bit. But according to the Jews, they respected Annas and considered him, by Jewish understanding, he was still emeritus high priest. He was the one who they held, who held the office in their eyes, although the Romans had appointed another. John would have been probably his son, Jonathan. Caiaphas was his son-in-law, who was now in the office. Alexander, we don't know who that was. He had the good fortune of being mentioned in Scripture, but nobody knows who he was, okay? He was somebody important, apparently. And as many as were of the family of the high priest, they were all gathered there at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power, oh, by the way, before I go on, Annas and Caiaphas, neither one has a very good reputation when you read the historical accounts that followed them. Those who wrote of them, history is not kind to them. These guys were wealthy and powerful, and they abused both their wealth and their power. They were dirty, rotten scoundrels in a position of authority, not well liked by the people. And here they are about to use their power and authority again for their own ends. All right. When they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? How would you like to be placed in the midst of the most powerful group of people, short of the Roman powers, in your territory. You're a Jew living in Palestine. You're now facing the most powerful group of people in the land. Do you think their knees were knocking? We'll see. They put them in the midst and they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Notice they didn't say, what have you done? They didn't try to get them to deny the healing. There was no denying it. As we'll read later, the man who was healed was right there in their midst too. Maybe he was arrested with them and spent the night in jail. Maybe he was called in the next morning as a witness. We don't know. But he was there that morning with them. And there was no denying the miracle. So what 
they're asking is not whether or not the miracle took place. The healing was obviously something that had happened. But they're asking by what power or by what authority, or by what name have you done this? In the Greco-Roman world, people sometimes outside of the Jewish faith would conduct healings in the name of someone, some god or some power. And so they're kind of giving them the opportunity to bow out here and say, you know, is there, you know who, who do you think you're doing this by? What power or what name? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Now, first of all, I want you to notice, they were probably trying to intimidate these guys. They put them in the midst. They accused them of something. They put them on trial, and they're expecting Peter to cower because, remember, he's the guy who was afraid to even admit that he knew Jesus, even with cursings, denied Christ in order to save his skin before. Now, they may be expecting the same kind of response. Let's rough these guys up a little bit. Let's intimidate them and watch them back down. But no, it says Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's our first indication that it's going to be different this time. It's not going to go as it had gone before. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he addresses them beginning respectfully, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. He knows who they are, he knows their position, and he respectfully addresses them. But what follows indicates that he really is now not speaking on his own authority, but God through his Holy Spirit is using him as a vessel. I want you to take a look at Luke chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. Luke 12, verses 11 and 12. And notice what Jesus had told his disciples. Now when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. Why? For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So whatever Peter and John may have been dealing with the night before, whatever they might have been concocting in their mind, whatever argument they may have been creating to defend themselves the next day, most important was that Jesus had promised in the very hour that they need it, the Holy Spirit would come and give them the words to speak. And that's what happens here in Acts chapter 4. <clears throat> you can also take a look at Luke 21, 14 and 15 for an example of that. We're going to move on, though. He goes on, then, after addressing them respectfully. In verse 9, he begins his defense. If we this day are judged, they're being judged, right? They're addressing the judges, the ones who have authority, the ones in the position of power. If we this day are being judged for a good deed done to the helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him... This man stands here before you whole. I don't sense any timidity there on Peter's part. <laughs> if you're calling us into account to judge us on something that we did, a good deed we did, to this man, here's the evidence before you, he stands before you whole. The word whole, actually, in your Bible it may say healed as well. It actually means salvation, so-so. It has to do with being completely saved. He stands here before you saved, saved from his condition, but also saved in Jesus Christ now. If that's what you're calling us to account for, let it be known to you and to everybody in Israel that we did it in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. They are not backing down. They're not going to throw out any other name, which is what they were hoping would happen. No, they're going to be right up front and tell you, we're not backing down on this. We're not afraid to tell you it was through Jesus Christ. That's whose name we called upon when we healed this man. Also, notice 
He says, whom you crucified. It's as if they turned it around. No longer are we on trial. You're on trial. You're the ones being judged because you crucified the very man whom God raised up, he goes on to say. While you may have denied him, while you tried to silence him, while you killed him, God put his stamp of approval on him and raised him up. Now, who's on trial? Not just from us. You're on trial from God. God is the one you'll have to answer to for this. This man stands here before you whole. Exhibit A. No denying it. He goes on to say in verse 11, This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. That was from Psalm 118. And he was following Jesus' lead in quoting it because Jesus, in the parable of the tenants, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in all of them, you have this recorded where Jesus re refers to this passage in Psalm 118 and applies it to himself. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone or capstone or keystone. It can be either any of those. The point is, it's the stone which is foundational to holding the whole building together. What you rejected, God has chosen. And that's especially significant when you understand that the scribes in Jewish understanding and in Jewish literature and commentary were considered builders. They called themselves builders of Israel. The stone which the builders had rejected has become the cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. In other words, Peter and John are saying, your religion is useless unless you have Jesus. Your religion cannot save you. That which you're practicing, you are experts in the law. You're leaders in Israel. You're proud of your position. You are rulers among the people. You have great authority. And you can strut about in your long robes and look holy all you want. But your religion is useless and it cannot save you unless you give yourself to Jesus. Because there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. In other words, if you call on some other name, and there are lots you can call on, you're not going to get an answer. This is the name under heaven. What's the goal? Heaven. What's the one name under heaven that can get us there? Jesus Christ. It's like dialing the wrong number if you're calling on somebody else. You won't get an answer because nobody else has been raised from the dead and is seated on the throne in heaven now who will judge us eventually but gives us life for all who want it. Eternal life is a gift. That's the name that gives us salvation. Do you think that was a popular message in Jesus' day? <laughs> they didn't want to hear it. Do you think it's popular today? Listen, we live in a pluralistic society where, you know, your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth and I'm okay and you're okay and we all figure out our own way and don't tell me you've got something figured out that I don't have figured out. Don't tell me your religion is what I need. That's the kind of world we live in today. That's where Satan has brought us. Hey, you want to tread the path of Buddhism and you can find peace? That's good for you. If you're a Muslim, okay, that's good for you. Baloney. According to the scripture, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Have I said it enough times? Acts 4.12. Get to know it. Get familiar with it. Jesus is the only way to be saved. I am the way, the truth, and the life, he said. No one comes to the Father except through me. Yes, it's true. We have from the writings of Ellen White, we have this insight that there will be people in heaven who have never heard the name of Jesus. Praise God. That just shows his grace and his mercy. But how did they get there? Through the blood of Jesus. And they're going to find out when they're there how it all happened. They're going to hear the whole story. They lived up to the light which they had, and God judged them worthy of eternal life because of their relationship to truth. But no one can be saved without the blood of Jesus. There is no other name under heaven 
given among men, by which we must be saved. That wasn't popular then, and it's not popular now. Some of you were here a few weeks ago when we heard from representatives of different faiths sharing with, them, with us their views of afterlife and end times. And you heard someone talking about the fact that in the end, God weighs your good deeds and your bad deeds on a scale, and all you can hope for is that your good deeds tip the scale in the right direction and God will give you entrance into heaven. But you cannot know, and that was said that night, you cannot know because only God knows. Even the prophet Muhammad said he didn't know, and only God would know. Where's the joy in that? But I know, because I know Jesus, that if I have the Son, I have life. I don't have to wonder and hope without hope that maybe I'll get to heaven. I am assured that Jesus is the ticket. Because I don't care how many good deeds you do. I don't care if you only sinned once in your life and from that moment on after repentance, you lived a perfect holy life. You've still got the problem of that one sin and balancing the scale to tip in your favor isn't going to take care of that one sin because the wages of sin is death. And if you break the law once, you are guilty of death. And therefore, you cannot outdo your bad sins with good deeds such that you could recommend yourself to God and say, I deserve to be in heaven. Because one sin alone makes you a sinner. And sinners cannot have entrance into heaven. So how in the world do we deal with it? Not by trying to be better and saying, God, look, I've done all this good stuff. That still leaves the problem of your Sin. You are a sinner even if you only sinned once in your life. You deal with it by accepting the grace and salvation of Jesus Christ who died for your sins and my sins on the cross. That is good news, folks. That's the kind of thing you can get excited about and say, I don't have to try to be good enough to get to heaven anymore because I know, you want to know a little secret? You're not good enough to go to heaven. Give it up. Forget it. You're not. I know because I'm not either. You cannot get there on your own merit. What's the use in trying? Quit trying to be good enough to go to heaven. I didn't say go out and enjoy a life of sin. <laughs> Quit trying to be good enough to go to heaven. Joy comes from knowing that I'm going to heaven even though I'm not good enough. Because Jesus is good enough. Jesus earned my salvation. And it wasn't cheap. Look to Calvary. Notice what happened on that cross. And then, in doing so, how dare you think that you're free to go on sinning because Jesus bought your salvation. No, when we realize what our sins did to Jesus that we put him there on that cross by our sins. We don't want to go on living in sin. We want to live now for his glory and to please him, not to get to heaven, but to glorify him and to say thank you that we're going to heaven. You see the difference? It's all about motive. A legalist says, I'm going to be good so I can go to heaven. I'm keeping the law so God will love me. A person living under grace says, I want to do my best to live according to God's law because he loves me. And I want to show him that I love him too. I want to honor him and glorify him. Peter made it pretty clear. There's only one way to heaven. And what you have been teaching the people ain't it, is what he's telling them. Verse 13. Shall we read verse 12 one more time? Just because, you know, it's a good one, right? And you're not tired of hearing it yet, right? Let's go to 12 and then continue on to 13. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Wow. He wrapped it up and hit it hard there at the end. And then it says, Now when they saw the boldness 
of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. The, the uneducated part, what's interesting there is it basically means they were unlettered. The scribes were lettered. They were unlettered. In other words, they have not been properly trained by our scribes. Who do they think they are? They didn't go to the right divinity school. They didn't go to any divinity school. Oh, but they had. They went to the school where they walked by the Sea of Galilee and over the hills in Nazareth, where they hung out with prostitutes and sinners because that's what their teacher was teaching them to do, to reach out and be salt in the earth. They went to the best divinity school. They walked with the master for three and a half years. But according to the rulers, they were uneducated and untrained men. So they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. That's the, that's the key to their boldness. That's the key to the success in their preaching. They had been with Jesus. Don't ever let it be said that because you have not gone to college or seminary or even high school, that you cannot be used for God's glory in building up his kingdom and saving souls. You walk with Jesus Christ, and people will take note of it. They took note that Peter and John had been with Jesus. God, I pray that people note that about me, that when they look at my life, they take note that I've been with Jesus. I may not be schooled. I don't have my Ph.D., I may not have a perfect understanding of theology, but I want people to at least know I've been with Jesus, and that ought to show in my life. And you can't stop the effects of that. Verse 14, And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside, <clears throat> sorry, to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. Dealing with this name again. We're trying to shut up this Jesus. Killing him didn't shut him up. We don't want to hear about him anymore, therefore, don't speak in his name. Now, all they could do was warn him. Actually, according to their law, they could not punish somebody who was unschooled without a warning first. In other words, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt. These poor folks, they're unschooled. They haven't been trained by the proper rabbis or scribes. They don't know what's going on. Therefore, the first time they offend you, the most you can do is give them a warning. And that's exactly what they were doing here. But do you know what happened? They shot themselves in the foot. Well, more than that. These rulers made a terrible mistake. By arresting Peter and John in the middle of the sermon, hauling them in before the council, and then realizing we really can't do anything with them, they basically put the word out to all the people of Jerusalem and Judea that, first of all, we are threatened by this message. That would cause people to take note of it. We're threatened by it. Secondly, we can't stop them. This is a message which challenges our religious authority. That would catch people's attention. And if you embrace this message, we can't really do anything to you. You put that word out, and now there's some walls knocked down where people are saying, I want in. I want to know about that. And besides, they haven't done anything at, as of yet. The religious authorities had just demonstrated, we can't really stop you. We can just make threats. And that's all they did. By the way, if you take a look at Acts 6, just flip over to Acts 6, verse 7. And notice this, and the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. I wonder how many of them were there that day when Peter and John boldly spoke 
before this council. Some of them heard it. There were priests there in their midst. And not just a few, it says a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Man, this thing is really picking up steam. It's rolling down hill fast, and it's growing like a snowball. Okay, pick up then. Uh, they told him no longer to speak to anyone in this name. You might as well tell the Mississippi River to go back to Minnesota. You know, how do you, how do you stop speaking about Jesus when you've had that kind of experience with him? When you and I are walking so closely to Jesus that he makes the biggest impact in our lives, bigger than anything, he's more important than football. He's more important than cars. He's more important than money. More important than my job. More important than even my family. More important than my house. My position, my respect, my authority. Whatever. Fill in the blank. When Jesus is supreme over all of that stuff in your life, and he is everything to you, you can't stop the force exuding from your life. And for them to tell them, now you just go away and you stop talking about Jesus. Don't mention his name to anybody else. It was the most ridiculous thing. to. How can you tell them to shut up about Jesus? It's all that matters to them. I wish that were the case in my life. I wish I could just focus so much on Jesus that other stuff... I'm not talking about being so heavenly minded I'm no earthly good. You know, you've met those kind of people. You know what they say, God is more interested in religious fruit. I'm sorry, spiritual fruit than religious nuts. Right? So I'm not talking about being a religious nut where you turn off everybody because all you can do is preach to people. But I'm talking about Jesus being so important in your life that people just know it. You can't stop that influence. All right. Um, but Peter and John, I'm in verse 19. Oh, let's go to 18. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. After all, they were judges, right? And they had called them together there so they could be judges. And he says, okay, I'll give you something to judge. Do you see how they're, they're speaking like Jesus now? Isn't that kind of a Jesus thing, the way they said that? Whether or not it's right to obey God more than you, or you more than God, you can be the judge of that. Jesus would always put things back on them with a question or a challenge, and that's exactly what they're doing now. You guys are great learned people. You're judges. Here's something for you to think about and give us judgment on this. Should we obey God or should we obey you? In essence, what they're saying is, you and God are not on the same page. We have to make a choice because what you're telling us is not what God's telling us. You're saying don't preach the name of Jesus. God has told us we're to preach the name of Jesus. Now you have to judge, should we obey you or God? I love it. I love their logic. I love their boldness. Someday you may have to make a statement like that before a ruling council. I'm not kidding. Someday, we may be the ones who can claim the promise that the Spirit will be given to us in the very hour that we need him to give us the words. And by God's grace, we'll speak boldly for Jesus. So you be the judge. It's like, um, you know, Socrates said something very similar. I don't know whether Peter and John knew about this, but he was told to silence his teaching. He was not allowed to, in Athens, he was told, you can no longer teach. And you know what he said? Men of Athens, I love you. And you can tell me what you want about not teaching, but I love you so much that I can't help. I will be obedient to the God, he said. And I will teach truth at any opportunity that I have. They couldn't shut Socrates up. Now, his message wasn't the Christian message, but he believed in his message, and therefore he said, I have to speak the truth. That's the kind of boldness that we should have, that the truth gets a hold of us. We don't have the truth. The truth has us, and it moves us to share it with others. In 1 Samuel 15, 22, the prophet told Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice, right? Right? And I know that Peter and John knew about that. 
and they decided we're going to be obedient to God. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, you know, okay, so we're going to threaten them even more if they're going to deny what we're telling them to do. They give them more threats, big deal. They let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. Isn't that amazing? The people were all glorifying God for what had been done. Now, if you're honest with yourself, and you're in that ruling council of the Sanhedrin there, do you think it might cross your mind to ask yourself this question? Whose side am I on? Somebody's been healed in the name of a man which apparently has been raised from the dead, plenty of witnesses say so, and now all the people because of it are glorifying God. He's standing before me, this man who's been healed in the name of Jesus. Maybe I'm not on the right side in this argument. We can be so dogmatically opposed to any other view than our own that we sometimes miss truth, right? You can present very clearly what Scripture teaches to somebody who refuses to accept it because they've already made up their mind before you opened your mouth, right? And that was the case here. They were now presented with a choice. Because when Peter and John asked, which is better, to obey, to obey you or to obey God, they weren't just asking the question for themselves, but they were sticking it to them with a challenge for them to consider as well. Are we obeying God or are we obeying ourselves and doing our own will? For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Okay, so he was old enough that he could speak for himself. You couldn't deny it. It was clear that God had worked here. And being over 40 years old, he was bold too. He wasn't, they weren't going to silence him. He wasn't a little kid that they could say, no, you don't do this. Am I up to what God is calling me to? Are you up to it? To boldly speak truth in a pluralistic society where people don't want to hear that there's only one way of salvation. Listen, if the ship is burning, do you want to stand around and argue about, no, 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 that's not the right kind of lifeboat, or do you want to get in the lifeboat? People will argue about, no, no, this is the way to salvation. But the truth is, only one person ever died and said, I died for your sins. And only one person ever rose from the grave and was witnessed by over 500 and then was witnessed by his followers ascending to heaven. And then angels said, this same Jesus is coming back for you in the same way. With all of that, are you going to argue about the means of salvation? Or are you going to get in the boat? and say, okay, here's a Savior who died for me. I'm reluctant to say this again because so many of you have heard it before, but I'll just briefly mention that when I was being shocked by 440 volts and I was hanging there waiting to die, I later, you know, saved by a miracle, an angel slapped me and broke the current. But afterward, I reasoned through this, and I said, wait a minute. I was investing in stuff that gave me no peace as I was facing death. Buddha didn't matter. Confucius didn't matter. Hinduism and all its gods didn't matter. My black belt didn't matter. My new age guru didn't matter. Those were the things that I had invested in in my life. And when I faced death, I had no peace. Eventually, it clicked in my head. There are a lot of teachers out there, but there's only one Savior. There's only one who said, I died for your sins, and I'm coming back for you. You know, when you understand that, the choice isn't so difficult. You just have to ask yourself, will I accept that gift? And then, and then, I will have peace. And I can face death with certainty now. I'm not looking forward to doing that. It's not like I'm volunteering for it. But I can face death with peace and certainty. Can you? Are you still trying to be good enough? 
Are you buying into Satan's lies? Listen, it's a gift. There's that one name, remember? We talked about this, I think, before. <laughs> there's one name, and there's one way to heaven. He's the, the one you call on for salvation. And the gift gives you peace. You know you're in if you have Jesus. You don't have to wonder about it. You don't have to worry about it. You're in because whoever has the Son has life. And when you believe, you've crossed over from death into life. He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. John 5, 24. I, I want to make that step again today. Day by day, I want to say, Lord, I'm stepping over. I'm in Jesus. You don't have to feel anything. You don't have to do anything spectacular to prove it. But will you at least today, again, make the decision, Jesus, I'm crossing over that line from death to life. I'm stepping in to you. I'm inside of you in, matter of, in the matter of faith. I'm trusting you. And in you, I know I have salvation. Thank God for that name, which means everything to us. Jesus. Jesus. He's the foundation. He's the cornerstone on which the church is built. And our faith and salvation is sure because he holds it all together.